Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming out, especially when it's so humid and filled with mosquitoes. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Russ Kane for inviting me to come and choosing an interesting topic, one that I have not given a talk on before. I'm very excited about it. And I want to thank the Houston chapter of the Native Plant Society for inviting me to come speak tonight. So I have a couple of things that um, I think Susie might be, okay, back there, yeah, handing out. So I brought a couple of handouts for you. So the first is a blue sheet front and back. And this is a flyer that we put in a sign at the edge of our property at home for our wildscape, our wildlife habitat, to explain to passersby what we do, how we do it, and then on the back to give them resources. So I think it's getting passed down on the edge. Please just share it with whomever, and I leave that as a resource for you. Second, there's a white sheet front and back, which are the resources in addition to those that I'll reference on my slides that I used in preparing for this talk and that I thought would be useful for you moving forward on some of the principles that I'm discussing tonight. If anyone wants a PDF or Word version of this so that you can simply hyperlink to these things instead of typing in the URL, old school, I have uh, sort of business cards with my personal contact information on there and please feel free to contact me. The last thing is that I brought you some treats. On that table by the window, I brought seeds of native plants, I think nine of them, that I've harvested from my own wildlife habitat gardens. Along with them are little Ziploc bags to take them home and because we're full service and I'm a teacher, you also have an instruction sheet that will tell you how to do things and you're welcome. <laughs> I got a lot of questions, how do you do it? I'm like, I don't know, they just reseed themselves. I got nothing. So it's there, take a few pinches, bring them home, and enjoy them. All right, so let's begin the begin. And what did I do with the clicker? Ah, here it is. Okay, so like I said, this talk is a little bit different from the ones that I've given before. Uh, there's some overlap, but I purposefully done something a bit differently. When Ross asked me to talk about um, how I came to love pollinators and how it is, what, it, what it's like to be a citizen scientist, I thought, that sounds really neat. And when I sat down to write it, I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to say? So I thought it would be good to introduce you to my personal walk, my personal journey that led me to have this passion, this desire to help pollinators and to promote their conservation. I'm going to do it first by telling you the story of St. Julian's Crossing. So this is a photograph from the summer of 2017 of our front yard gardens. I live in Oak Forest. Our house is under 1,600 square feet and the yard is comparable. I'd say now probably half of the front yard is converted to garden beds. Um, and I'll talk about percentages of native plants in a minute with only one small raised bed in the back. The biodiversity about which I will speak comes from this not from a nature preserve, not from a national park. And if I can do it, and I'll give you a few tips, you can do it because pollinators need us. We're on the front lines. So let me tell you where I got the name from. So the name St. Julian's Crossing is, well, first off, I'm Catholic. So of course I've got to dedicate our gardens to a patron saint, of course. So my husband, who's not a Catholic, I was talking to him about it, I was like, you know, I'd love to devote it to St. Francis, but a lot of things are devoted to St. Francis as patron saint of ecology. I love St. Francis, but maybe something different. Hmm, rack my brains, rack my brains. Five minutes later, after a Google search, he goes, how about St. Julian the Hospital? And I said, who? <laughs> and he said, he's the patron saint, among other things, of travelers and innkeepers. And we adopted the name when we became a monarch way station because the monarchs travel through the end of our garden, right? And I was like, baby, you sure you're not Catholic? Just checking, right? <laughs> okay, so that's how the name St. Julian's Crossing came to be. And this is how we started, and this is all you need to know about how we started. A vast wasteland of mainly St. Augustine grass and non-natives. So just as nature evolves, we evolved as well. This process started, I'd say, when did we have that big drought, 2015, 11, 12? at 13, so we were on a tough love policy, and if it lived, it lived, if it died, it died, and go figure, it died. <laughs> 
So I said to my husband, I tell you what, we need to be ecologically responsible. So no matter what else, we need to put in drought tolerant plants. And oh, butterflies are pretty. So let's put in some flowers. So we had a gardener who helped us to install a few of the beds that we have now, but of course we've expanded. And he put in mainly non-native plants, things that were resistant to insects eating them. Mm -hmm, sound familiar? All right, I'm preaching to a lot of you here, right? Okay, and so they were pretty, but we had almost no critters come by because the pollen wasn't right for them. They hadn't co-evolved with those plants and they couldn't use it. Or the nectar didn't have all the nutrients because nectar is not neutral. And for sure, the critters couldn't eat the leaves on most of these because most insects, Doug Tallamy says about uh, citing a study in his book, uh, I'll talk about it later, he says, you know, about 90% of insects are specialists on plants. And that means they can eat plants of only one family, genus, or species, especially when it comes to leaf chemistry. So our garden was pretty, but it didn't attract a lot. So I started learning. I thought, there is too much to learn, and I know nothing. Nothing. And I had a brown thumb. So I connected with a gardening group in my neighborhood, and then I met wonderful people like Kimberly and Mike Eckenfels and a bunch of others, and I met the people in this group. And I met the butterfly enthusiast of Southeast Texas. So if you have not started on the path to a wildscape, this is my two cents of advice. The most important thing you can do is to connect with other people who do this stuff. Do not do it on your own or reinvent the wheel. And so it came to pass that we had our garden certified through NABA, through the National Wildlife Federation, Federation and through Monarch Watch. And I'm working on a couple of more. This is how the gardens looked in 2016. I'd say they were maybe 20, 30% native-ish. And we had a pretty good amount-ish, you know. Um, we had a pretty good amount of insects coming, but not a ton. By the next year, we were 50% native. And the biodiversity had started exploding. I mean, it went up exponentially. These are our gardens today. Okay, I. I Patty, my friend Patty, had a great idea, which I didn't have time for, for this talk of doing an overhead schematic so that you could see. So what you can see is, yeah, I've got a Vitex in there. I have a Copper Canyon Daisy. But I'm 65 to 70% native now. And I, all I can tell you is this. About a month ago, I went out in the garden, and I found five new-to-me insect species. Now, how many of you can say that? In, not you. <laughs> but how many of us can say that with a traditional garden that has plants from other areas of the world that nothing here can eat. I am convinced that the biodiversity in our gardens is a direct result of the use of native plants and of techniques, a few of which I'll discuss tonight. You with me? So those are our gardens. And that's from across the street. So not huge. So this is, this is why I love pollinators. Thanks to Russ for the, my love affair with pollinators. So how did I first get interested in them? I mean, I started just because butterflies were pretty. But then I started observing as I planted new things. I have an inquisitive mind. So their beauty captivated me. Um, on the back of the purple, I'm sorry, the blue sheet, at the top of the resources, you'll see a, a reference to my Facebook educational community, St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Habitat, with the URL, but you can type in the name. And what I discovered when I first started that, because I know that many people are predominantly visual in their learning, I threw up pictures of the creatures that I photographed. Every photograph of an insect that you see here tonight, I took in my own gardens with my cell phone. With my cell phone. This close to them, 50 shots for one good one, I tell you. <laughs> but that one good one. So I put those up there and people responded. Because people love pretty things, right? That's why I responded. So bees, who can tell me what this middle flower is? Texas frog fruit. Everyone, hold up this participatory. Hold up your pinky finger. Look at the pink part of your pinky finger. That is the size, approximately, of a flower head of a Texas frog fruit. Each of the individual flowers is smaller than the pink of your pinky fingernail. That is a bee. That's a lasioglossum, a species, a genus in the genus, a genus of sweat bee. That's a bee. He's about three millimeters long. So some of the smallest ones, like this small carpenter bee, look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? They come in greens. They're iridescent. They come in blues. They have, as this female leafcutter bee does, 
They carry the pollen on their underside, some females do, some on the hind legs. Look how beautiful that is. The larger bees shown here, like this one on the right-hand side, are carpenter bees. Hold up your thumb. I'm not going to make you count. That'd be too hard for this evening, right, with not enough coffee. From your knuckle to the tip of your thumb is about the size of a bumblebee, approximately the size of your average carpenter bee. So I have everything from teeny tiny to big thing. There are 4,000, approximately, species of bee in North America, and honeybee is not one of them. In fact, the vast majority of bees are what we call solitary bees. They're named that way because they are solitary nesters in one form or another. Only some bees, the minority, are true social. We call those eusocial. Honeybees, not native, and bumblebees. The rest of them live in some sort of ish of solitary. What does that mean? That means single moms. The males mate, go off and nectar. The females create the, the uh, chamber. They provision it with food for the larva, and they lay the eggs. Okay? 70% nest in the ground. 30% nest in teeny stem plants or in wood or in crevices. Pretty cool. I'm telling you this for reasons that will become apparent later. These guys feed, the adults feed on nectar and the babies feed on pollen. And speaking of pollen, that's where you have a lot of what are called specialist bees, bees that need particular pollen of a particular family, species, or genus of plant. And their tongues are various lengths. Butterflies. So on the presentation, I had originally told Russ 45, 44 species, but we have 45 species of butterfly that I've recorded. Some of them are small, about the size of your pink of your thumbnail, like the hair streaks here, and some of them are larger. They, along with moths, nectar, again, the adults nectar, and the juveniles, or the, their larvae, feed on leaf matter. They feed with a proboscis, which is like a long tongue, sort of, and it uses capillary action primarily to drink and to feed. I have no idea how many moths we have because most of them are nocturnal. These are some of the diurnal ones that I've seen and some that were just chilling in the morning because they were late risers. But aren't they gorgeous? Aren't those beautiful? Flies also pollinate. In fact, there was a meta-study compiled of various studies, one I believe, God, I can't remember where it was, maybe on California, I don't know, that said, of course, bees are the best pollinators because they're fuzzy, fuzzy on the wizzy. So they hold pollen best as they move from plant to plant. But if you take together all the other insect non-bee pollinators, they are equal in pollinating value. A huge component are certain of the flies, including my favorite family, Newsflash, I have a favorite fly family, <laughs> hashtag bug nerd, of hoverflies, which are these guys. And by the way, what does this one in the bottom left corner kind of look like? Wow. Yeah. That's called Batesian mimicry, where something that can't harm you or is not distasteful imitates, has evolved to imitate something that is. This looks kind of like a bee, doesn't it? It's a fly. So again, that's my favorite family. Um, bees. Uh, wa uh, English. Flies have spongy, shallow mouth parts for the, the most part. And that's how they nectar. Wasps also are pollinators. And I have become one with the wasp in my garden. I used to chase them off because what do they eat that we love? Catters, right? Butterfly caterpillars. But they have babies to feed too. And they will also eat, depending on the size and the species, your mealybugs, white flies, aphids, things like that. And they pollinate. Why? Because their little bodies, although not generally fuzzy, rub against the flower and transfer the pollen. We're up to 25 plus species of wasp. I stopped counting at 30 species of bee in our gardens. And really, any animal that takes the pollen from the male component of the flower and deposits it in the female part of the flower is a pollinator. So I tell kids all the time the four bees, bees, bugs, bats, and hummingbirds, <laughs> and other stuff. Right? It can be lizards, whatever. So then I'm really interested. Like, I'm seeing these pretty things and documenting them. I don't know what the heck they are. So I started learning about them. And one of the things that I learned is that they're really important for what we eat. So about two-thirds of, of our crops re rely on animal pollination. Some is wind pollination, self-pollination, other things. 
About a third of what you eat every day requires pollination by insects, and of course, there's a huge market value for this. They're also food for animals. Now, I, we all heard the uh, early bird gets the worm, right? So about a quarter of the birds are insectivores. We also know they eat seeds, grains, berries, things like this. But their babies almost never do. The babies eat insects. And Dr. Doug Tallamy, an entomologist whose book I'm going to tell you about in a minute, who's amazing. I aspire to be him when I grow up. He did a study on chickadees a few decades back. And he found that a single mom of chickadee needs thousands of insects to feed one clutch of babies. Thousands. So if you have no insects, what do you also lack? Birds. Moreover, amphibians, reptiles, eat them directly. Again, that's part of your uh, pest control. And then finally, squirrels and so forth, mammals, will often eat nuts and berries. But what needs to happen before we have nuts and berries? Pollination. And of course, increased plants, because 75 to 95% of our flowering plants require animal pollination in order to propagate. So more plants equals better erosion control, equals better atmosphere, and so forth. You with me? So these guys matter. I also came to discover that they are in serious trouble. Uh, Wally may have been referencing this. Um, it's a study done in Germany over almost 30 years, so am I remembering right, about insect levels? And they found a 70-something percent decline in insects. That should horrify each of us. Horrify us. And I've probably got the statistics wrong. But you get the gist. Dr. Doug Ptolemy says, insects can live without us. We cannot live without insects. We cannot. So every little bit helps. They're also pressured because we've taken their habitat. This used to be prairie. It is no longer prairie, and it's not going back to prairie. But rejoice and be glad. <laughs> there is something that each of us can do at our homes that will help with that, and we'll talk about it later. So they need our help. So that inspired me. And just for me personally, my own personal faith, my religious faith as a Catholic inspired me as well. And of course, this takes us back to St. Francis, Canticle of the Creatures, sometimes called Canticle of the Sun. Uh, Pope Francis, a few years back, wrote an amazing encyclical on the environment and social justice. I highly recommend it. But I'm going to read to you a very short passage about the inspiration of St. Francis that applies in the secular realm as well as religious. And this is what gets me up in the morning. Francis helps us to see that an integral ecology calls for openness to categories which transcend the language of mathematics and biology. Can you hear me OK? Mm -hmm. And take us to the heart of what it is to be human. His response to the world around him was so much more than intellectual appreciation or economic calculus. For to him, each and every creature was a sister united to him by bonds of affection. That is why he felt called to care for all that exist. Such a conviction cannot be written off as naive romanticism, for it affects the choices which determine our behavior. If we approach nature and the environment without this openness to awe and wonder, if we no longer speak the language of fraternity and beauty in our relationship with the world, our attitude will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless exploiters, unable to set limits on their immediate needs. By contrast, if we feel intimately united with all that exists, then sobriety and care will well up spontaneously. The poverty and austerity of St. Francis were no mere veneer of asceticism, but something much more radical a refusal to turn reality into an object simply to be used and controlled. Now, if that doesn't get you going, along with a cup of coffee in the morning, I don't know what does. So then I wanted to help. And I thought, my gosh, I know nothing about nothing. I'm an attorney, actually a professor. Joke. <laughs> and true. And so I wanted to help. So the first thing I did was transform our gardens, and because I didn't win the lottery over four years, slowly but surely, into a wildscape. We'll talk a little bit about that process in a minute. That is the single most effective thing that you can do, is to have native plants and to amend your practices to make your garden inviting to insects. Number one, and it doesn't matter the size of your garden. It matters the number of people who have them. 
because you saw how small those pollinators were. If I'm two to three millimeters long, I'm not going from Oak Forest to Memorial Park, but by gum, I can get to my next door neighbor's patch of Gallardia pulchella. And then I can get to the Gulf Coast Penstemon down the road. You with me? They need the stepping stones. We'll talk about that in a minute. I also began sharing, as I have over here with seeds, each of those seeds, it's native to this particular eco-region. Enjoy afterwards, you're welcome. And because I'm a teacher and my passion is teaching, I decided, well, I don't know exactly what I'm doing yet, but by gum, I'm gonna start talking. So I started talking and I've learned as I've gone. And then I thought, there are scientists, because I'm not a scientist and I don't play one on TV, <laughs> I do not. So there are scientists who are looking at how to protect these creatures that I love. And what they need, folks, is data. So then I just started discovering there's this whole category of people like you and me, those of us, that is, who are not scientists, wildlife biologists or entomologists, who are what has been described as citizen scientists. This is not new. Darwin, as Russ Kane mentioned in 2016 at workshop. So this is an individual who voluntarily contributes his or her time, effort, and resources towards scientific research, either alone or in collaboration with professionals. Gardeners are particularly well situated to be citizen scientists, to collect in a fun way, golly, it's fun, but to collect the data that scientists need because we are there on those front lines. The first trophic level, level of energy, transferring it, right, is plants. The second is insects, and then other things eat insects. We are there with the plants by gum. And so we have to change our way of thinking as we're out in the garden. Does that make sense? So my invitation today, after I've talked about my little walk, is to invite you, when you are out doing what you love in the garden, to view it in a different way. So I started thinking about how would I tell people to do this? And I think there are three steps. There's invite, what did I write? Observe and share, okay? So I'm gonna walk through this. Let's start with invite. Notice the bee. Aww. Aww. Okay, invite is to create a wildscape at home. So let's talk very briefly about what I mean by wildscape. It is a garden, the primary purpose of which is to support wildlife. Let me say it again. It is a garden, the primary purpose of which is to support wildlife. Yes, in an urban area, it must be aesthetically pleasing. The most important thing you could do is to use native plants. We'll talk about what that means. The second is to avoid pesticides, and the third is to vary your plantings in ways that we'll discuss. So, use native plants. I'm going to recommend four books to you. They're at the bottom of the white sheet of paper on the back. If you have no other naturalist book in your collection and you want to wildscape, have this one. This is Dr. Doug Tallamy, Bringing Nature Home. It's over 10 years old, but it is amazing. He does not write like an entomologist. <laughs> he writes like you and I would write. It's engaging, it's convincing, it's motivating. Uh, the Xerxes Society puts out attracting native pollinators. You can see I have URLs. This is where you can order that. This actually is a website meant to support his talks. This is the book I was referencing before, Claudia West and Thomas Rayner, Planting in a Post-Wild World. Just understand that they come from the perspective that it's okay to use non-natives. Okay? I would say that if you're looking for a wildscape, and I, I don't fault them on that. It's just they say, what grows here now? but rely heavily on natives. I would say rely very heavily on natives if you are creating a wildscape. Do you see what I'm talking about? There's a fantastic book. It's probably written a little more for landscape designers, but it's, it's understandable and it's wonderful. This one is Doug Townley again with Rick Dark, and it takes his principles and it applies them to landscaping design at your home. It's really accessible. <coughs> okay, so what do I mean by native plant? So, Native Plant Society defines it as a plant evolving and occurring naturally without human intervention in a particular region or environment. And Doug Tallamy explain, explains it similarly, except he says that it is a plant that has co-evolved with the other wildlife in that ecoregion. 
You can't think of a native plant in an abstract. It's part of an ecosystem, which is a complex web. Okay? So here you see, if you, I have the URL down there, it's an EPA document. We are primarily in the Houston area in 34A, which is northern humid Gulf Coast Prairie. Again, every plant, the seeds of which I brought and every plant on the table, is native to that particular ecoregion. But this is a great reference to figure out what is native in your area. So, why do we want to use natives? Very briefly, because they feed more critters. Again, if you have a specialist bee whose larvae need a special genus, family, or species of pollen to survive, then if you don't have that in your garden, you might have bees nectaring for days. Not an issue. But they can't reproduce and support their larvae. Do I know which bees are specialists that come to my garden of the 30-something I've documented? No. Do I precisely know what their plants are that feed them? No. But by gum, if I have 70% of my plants as native ones to the prairie, Gulf Coast Prairie, I'm going to hit something. Likewise with leaf, as I said, even more so the chemistry of leaf matters. Dr. Doug Tallamy says, to paraphrase, if a plant's not feeding something in some way, it is not doing its job. So think nectar, pollen, leaf. My, my mistake at the beginning, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, is that I didn't think about the leaves. I didn't think about it. They're also hardier in our climate. Hardier means you don't have to replace them as much. Hardier means that once they are established, you know, if you have chosen native plants that don't require a lot of water, then you don't have to water them a lot. Of course, there are native plants that require a lot of water because they have evolved in wetter areas of Texas. But I can tell you my Gallardia pulchella, my India blanket that I have over there, also called blanket flower, I literally never water it in the summer. Never. I never water lance leaf coreopsis. I never water Texas lantana. Never. Ever. Now that saves money. And that saves time. And by gum, those things are going to spring up from seed in the next year. They also are fantastic for saving, sequestering, and purifying water. I talked about saving. You water less. I have no sprinkler system. I don't use sprinklers. I spot water for things like Turk's cow, for example. Some of the penstemons made as needed. So this is a slice of ground in a prairie. Some of the plants that grow in the prairie have roots that are 14 feet deep. They are deeper than an adult human is tall. That stuff siphons water down into the soil. Um, the latest statistic, I had a statistic from the Native Landscaping Certification Program with uh, NEPSOP, but I just heard from Katy Prairie Conservancy that they have a study that says, that actually shows that prairie can absorb even more than what I thought before. Eight inches of water per hour in a native prairie. Guess how much for St. Augustine according to the KPC study? <laughs> Half an inch. And an inch according to other studies. I want that. <laughs> Especially in Houston. Now not all native plants have roots that deep. A lot of the grasses do. But my Gallardia pulchella has roots that go down really pretty deep. Milkweed, the native ones, tap roots. So I want that. And it's okay if they get out. What you don't want to get out is stuff like Chinese collar. Brought in in the ornamental trade, what, 50s, 60s? Because insects don't eat it. That's the problem. It's also invasive and prolific. And when it gets out, it has destroyed entire prairie remnants. It is the horrible gift that keeps on giving. And they do get out if they are invasive. So, make sense? If you want more, find the KPC video on its Facebook page. Second, avoid pesticides. So these are equal opportunity killers. So I used a little bit at the beginning when I had uh, white flies on, I guess it was a lantana or something, it was a non-native hybrid. And I didn't feel good about it, but it was one of the less bad ones. And I've heard about using neem oil on aphids, and now I never use pesticides. Here's why I don't. Because a healthy wildscape 
is a healthy balance of predator and prey. Oh, six? One, five. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Russ is my timekeeper here. Healthy balance. Ptolemy says, if you want to get rid of garden pest insects, you need more insects. How do you bring them in? You don't use pesticides. It means things go in cycles. We have aphid infestations. I have it now on Agora. I have it on my green milkweed, uh, Scopia spiritus. They last about two weeks. You know why? Because then the female hoverflies come and they lay their eggs and their larvae are predaceous and they can siphon up 200 to 400 aphids before they pupate. A single one. I have four species of lady beetles that attack an infestation on my gara. The larvae and the adults feed on them. Here are some other examples. That's a lot of stuff that eats critters. But what happens if I blast my milkweed and my other plants to get aphids off with a high stream of water or I squish them or I use neem oil? What else am I getting rid of? That's right, the predators, the larvae. And it's not just the predators, it's also, whoops, I don't have it there, the parasites. I know a lot of people don't like tachinid flies. Tachinid flies, and that's only one species. Uh, lay their eggs inside the body of another insect, the host insect, and they do that in butterfly caterpillars. We see that a lot with monarchs, for example. But I'm happy when I see them. This particular one, kind of pretty. This particular one is a, par a parasite on um, ah, some type of green stink bug that eats your vegetables, and also on a squash borer moth. You want this dude, right? And these are wasps, and I'll show you quickly before we move on. This is an aphid. That is a wasp. She's about three millimeters big. She is putting her ovipositor, her leg, egg-laying organ, into the body of the aphid, laying her egg. It will hatch and devour the aphid from the inside. And have you ever seen in your oleander aphids, these brown ones that are big? That has a, a parasite inside and it will eventually explode. <laughs> Sorry, aphids. <laughs> but they do this for mealybugs, white fly scale. That, I want that in my garden, right? And there are your plantings. I'm gonna speed it up a smidge. Is it too fast? Okay. I'm a Seinfeld fast talker, so just raise your hand. Okay, so you wanna have flowers of different sizes and colors because you saw the myriad insects that pollinate. So, different sizes because butterflies that are larger need a landing pad to land on. So things like composite flowers that have big petals are a good choice for them. You also want things of different colors because insects see different things in the color spectrum. So bees are particularly good at seeing whites, um, yellows, and purples, but they can't distinguish red from green. Hummingbirds and butterflies are much better at reds, so mix it up. You also want flowers with different shapes. Composites are great for getting hoverflies because they're shallow. It's one-stop shopping, right? Each of those is a nectar reward. Things like two, or, sorry, umbelliform flowers. These are things like dill, fennel, uh, milkweed. Things like tubular flowers, salvia coccinia or scarlet sage, turk's cap. That is actually a hoverfly on that salvia coccinia. And what's interesting is those teeny little bees will go inside and they'll pollinate and they'll nectar, but those bigger bees will do what's called nectar robbing. They'll punch, puncture the base and suck out the nectar. That is, salvia coccinia is my number one plant for certain species of um, carpenter bee. And then of course mallows, things like wine cups, like the cross grape wine cup I brought. Just vary it because they have different tongue sizes or mouth parts and sizes. Make sense? You also want to have things blooming in each season. The worst thing is you invite them in in the spring with a great buffet and there's nothing in the fall. So just make sure that you have something blooming in each season of the year. And finally, include host plants for larvae of caterpillar and moths. Things like milkweed for monarchs and queen butterflies. And, so and I, don't make the mistake that I did where I put all of my host plants together because the wasps find them. Mm -hmm. Spread them out throughout your garden. So that's how to invite. Beyond that, if you want to help the scientific community, and you're not a scientist, like I'm not a scientist, the second thing you need to observe, and this is just a fun part. This is so cool. 
The most important thing is you need to be prepared to stop and wait. When I, my husband knows that when I go out to do a quick trim, I'm out there for who knows how long. Because I see a little thing fly by and I don't know what it is, so I crawl on my belly until I find it. This is the number one thing that you need to do to change if you want to be able to collect data that can be used. Second, look for the small. Each of these is three millimeters long or less. So once again, we have the wasps. These are wasp folks. That's a Gallardia pulchella leaf or petal. Those are wasps. They had just hatched. These are the parasites, like this one. You see the egg-laying device right there? That's on a Biden's alba. What do you call that? Shepherd's needle? I don't have any more. It's not native here. Uh, those are a few millimeters. And to document them and record them, just to see them, to see the dance. Like, how many people have ever seen this? These are examples of hoverflies, right here. This is called a margined calligrapher. Isn't that lovely? This one's feeding on a yarrow, and that one on a frog fruit. These are both species of hoverfly that have predaceous larvae that will suck out your garden paths. And finally, tiny bees. So be attuned to little things, and don't assume like I did when I first started. Oops, sorry, Russ. Don't assume that every little tiny thing that zips by is a gnat because it may be a bee or a wasp. And follow it and learn about it. Does anyone know, by the way, this is my middle finger right here. Does anyone know what that is? It's a skull. Do you think it's reptile, amphibian, mammal? Mammal, gotcha, those teeth, those teeth, right? What is it? A rat? No, not a rat. No. Nope. It's a bat. Oh, wow. And it may have been a juvenile. My friend Ryan saw it in the garden because he was looking for little things with his kids. Isn't that the coolest? That's so cool. <laughs> like, how many people have seen that? Seriously. And then this, this is a brown anole, Anola sagre, which is not a native species. You've seen these in the gardens. They look like Jurassic Park, man. What is this little one standing on? Oh, Again, pinky fingernail, right? This little guy had only just hatched. His whole body almost fit on the head of a single flower. They're, the mother abandons them after she lays the eggs. And by the way, this could have been a green anole or a brown anole egg. They're laid on the surface of the dirt or just under it. And by the way, what I'm doing here with these tips is just showing you cool stuff that I found. Seriously. It's about the size of a hummingbird egg, except it's leathery to the touch. If you see it, just put it right back on the dirt. And they'll hatch. And these guys will knock out your pups. They're awesome. It's, how could I not show you that? <laughs> the other thing you need to do is look for associations. This will help you as a gardener, as well as help you if you decide to record the data and share it. So what feeds on what? What plants do such and such a species like? If they're predators, what do they eat? So I've discovered a species of moth likes my yellow wild indigo. It's in the pea family, not surprising as much as it likes my blue bonnets. Um, I've also discovered that the carpenter bees, like I said, like that salvia coccinia. So when I photograph things, I jot down some notes. Do you have to? No. If you don't have time, it's OK. But if you can photograph the association and identify it when you share it and say plant and animal, believe me, I'm not a scientist, but they've told me that's extremely helpful, especially to identify species. Likewise, you want to look for symbiosis. I'm saying it wrong, which is where animals work together for the benefit of both. So I've actually observed that the little ants come up, stroke the aphids to get their honeydew, and provide them some protection, although a friend of mine said she was reading a study that says that ants actually paralyze them and then take all their honeydew. <laughs> blah, blah. <laughs> so just make, be conscious not only of the little things that you see, but be conscious of the associations that they're making. As a gardener, this helps me because if there's a, I like a particular kind of bee and I'm not seeing a lot of it, but I see it likes this plant, I'm going to put more of those plants in. For sure. Right? And then look for the cool stuff. So here's some cool stuff. Courting and mating. 
So these are all examples of some of the mating that I recorded. And by the way, scientists like to see this. They like to see the mating habits and the courting. So this is kind of cool because these are Zelus longipes, which are, I'm sorry, saying it wrong, which is milkweed assassin bugs. These are your friends in the garden. These are your friends. They're mating, but it takes so long to make that they needed a snack. <laughs> so here they are. <laughs> This is cool. This is a thread-waisted wasp. I don't know what species in that family. How many antennae do you see? Six. Six. Two males were attacking this poor female, and they were fighting each other to be able to mate with the female. And these moths, I think, are actually nocturnal. I think it's a salt marsh moth. But here they were. They just fell asleep. There they were. <laughs> you know. This is the coolest one. I want you to look at this. This is the male on top. This is a cuckoo leaf cutter bee, genus, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Science. Okay. I want you to look at his antennae and his wings. I videotaped this for five minutes. I'm going to show you a few seconds, but listen as I talk about it. So what's cool is I'm over here in the, whoops, sorry, the bean. <laughs> Russ. I'm over here in the frog fruit, and the female is feeding on the frog fruit. She's nectaring. All of a sudden, this lightning bolt comes from my right side, grabs her, and goes three or four feet away to this leaf. I think this was a tropical milkweed, which is no longer in my garden. Yay. And then the courting started. This went on for over five minutes, probably closer to ten. Do you see the antennae? So I recorded it. And then I documented, he picked her up here, he grabbed her and went four feet. That guy's like less than a centimeter, maybe half a centimeter long. The scientist who I uploaded it said to me, we have not, I have never observed. This is someone from UC, not UC Davis, but one of the University of California entomology groups. And a Canadian person said, I've never seen antennae movements like that. I've never seen the courting like that, or the wing movements. And I recorded it, why? Because I was willing to put my trowel and my clippers down to record it. I didn't know what the heck, but I just put it up and shared it. That's the difference. Then you want to record metamorphosis and growth. Okay, so at the different stage of a part of a complete or incomplete metamorphosis, record those things because that data is interesting. Does anyone know what this creature is? It's a nymph. So incomplete metamorphosis. This is another milkweed assassin bug. When I say incomplete, it goes from egg to nymph. Mold, nymph, mold, nymph, mold, nymph, adult. This is one of the nymph phases. I just so happened to see it going out of its shell, you might call it, I think it's exuvie, <clears throat> and it left it. And notice the antennae were encased in the shell. And then, of course, it's this bright orange, and it darkens as the outer shell, the exoskeleton, hardens. Now, that's cool. Seriously. Like, who needs TV? <laughs> Then things like metamorphosis and growth. I do not know if this is the same species. I think this is all the um, spotless lady. Is it spotless lady beetle? I haven't written down. Hold on. Doesn't matter. I think it's all the same lady beetle. This is right after they hatch from the egg. They're like one to two millimeters. This is one shedding or molting again. This is the pupa. This is the empty pupa. And this is the adult. I think it's the same species, but unfortunately I had two on that plant. Here it is. Count that, I can't find it, it doesn't matter. Bottom line is, that's cool, right? So if I saw these little things and didn't know better, I might have thought they were plant suckers and thought, well, maybe I should remove them. No, they're predators. And metamorphosis and growth. I'm going to tell you the plant that I found this little egg on, and this is a caterpillar hatching. And someone tell me the species of butterfly. It is a Hercules club. Giant swallowtail. Papilio crispantus. I recorded it coming out of the egg. How cool is that? Seriously. It's so tiny. So anyway, I won't spend much time on it. Nesting and egg laying, ovipositing, which is the most hilarious name ever. I love it. Um, five minutes are examples of here, and that's also important. I want to point out one. This is a hoverfly, by the way. This is an Asian lady beetle, one of our non-natives. I actually caught her laying her eggs. How cool is that? This is the neatest one. This is an American lady, 
butterfly. I didn't know what her host plants were. Has anyone had this little cud weed in their yard before? Yeah. A friend of mine calls it, Carol Leonard Clark calls it cud weed. I don't know what the name is. If someone knows, let me know. It's one of our little, little I think, native weeds. I used to pull it out. She lays her eggs on it. Am I ever going to pull that out again? Never. I am not like the hell. <laughs> and this is a leaf cutter bee nest. The females cut off with their mandibles. They cut off leaf. They use it like wallpaper in their nesting tube. They nest in crevices or in tubes or in stems or in wood. We drill a hole. And then they it's egg, pollen, leaf, egg, pollen, leaf. So I want to show you something else I found. This is a mama cutting the leaf. Sorry, it's sort of like handheld, whatever. Do you see that shape she leaves? Have you seen those semicircles? That means you have leaf cutter bees. Isn't that cool? And then feeding and drinking. Uh, what I thought was cool here is that this paper wasp, it's a genus Polistus, is actually eating the spittle bug spittle. He's, the doctor, he's not going for the larva inside. And this is a, a butterfly. Remember I told you that their proboscis is absorbs like capillary action? They don't actually drink from baths and stuff. They puddle, which means they look for damp earth. And they put their proboscis in, and it absorbs both fluid, which they also get from nectar and minerals. So have a little dish with dirt in it and keep it moist. And feeding and drinking. This is a lady beetle larva, and this is a hoverfly larva. And look at this. Isn't that cool? Sorry, many bees. Um, so I'm just going to advance. Look also for season and context. What was the weather like? What time of day was it? And I can tell you from the notes that I take which species of bee is out right as first light hits the plants. And it's not all. Document. <clears throat> take notes and photograph. If you are interested in doing this, never, ever, ever, did I say ever, 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 go out in the garden without some kind of camera. I bring my cell phone. It doesn't matter if it's a good picture. Take as many angles as you can. Get the dorsal thorax right behind the head. Get the abdomen, get the legs, get the face if you can. All of that is important for identification. So, invite. Hope it's not too fast. I want to be true to my time. Invite, observe, share. So where the heck do I share this stuff? So one of the places to share are on citizen science platforms. The one that I use, and I haven't been as good about it in the last year or so, um, I'll tell you about in a minute. What's really great is that these platforms are searchable by people doing research, by species, region, a bunch of other criteria. They're also a social network. I've made a whole community of friends through iNaturalist, which is what I use, the first one listed. Um, that community helps me identify insects that I don't know the ID for. I throw it out there and I put ID unknown, needs ID. And the community helps me. Hive mind tells them. We also did a bio blitz in 2016 here in East Texas as part of a national national parks wild uh, bio blitz to record bio data. It's a fantastic way to meet people, and it's easy. You can upload stuff from your cell phone right onto the platform, and there are others. This is what iNaturalist looks like on the web. This is the um, app on my phone. And Nature's Notebook, I have several friends who use it. Same kind of thing. It allows you to upload data. That mass data is easily searchable by researchers. I cannot highly enough recommend that. Because having the data is one thing. But it's not helping the scientific community if you don't put it out there. The second way is to share them on special interest social media. The benefits of this are there's less formal connecting with experts because I'll give you an example in a minute, and it's just fun. So on Facebook, one of my favorites, some of my favorites are the Texas ones, Texas Plants and Invertebrates, Native Bee Co-op. So if I have a photograph of an insect in my garden and I don't know what it is, I upload that photo to one of these groups on Facebook. Super easy, y'all, just right from your phone. And I give some data. This is where I, approximately where I live, but not my address. Thank you very much. Hashtag no stalkers. Um, 
this is the plant I saw it on, this was the weather. And true Kimberly, people respond right away. And I'm now connected with several scientists because of that. Um, entomology is a fantastic one. And then you can also directly find projects, research projects, that they're looking for mass data on. So instead of putting it in a place where they can search for mass data, the researchers can, you can go and hunt for those research projects. Sci Starter is one on National Geo, and the government has another as well. Does that make sense? Invite, second, observe, set third, share. You pass the test. So thank you, and happy wildscaping.